All right, everybody, welcome into the Alley Oop. I'm your host, Ryan Blackburn. Thank you so much for the reception yesterday on the inaugural episode of the podcast. It was fantastic. Blown away by all of the support and all of the positive reaction that uh, came out yesterday. I'd been pushing this. I'd been uh, not not exactly coy uh, when it comes to the release of this podcast, but had been holding on to this for a while. And I don't think anybody really fully appreciated the scope of what was going on until I released that correspondence list. Holy cow, uh, there's a lot of awesome people on this show, and I am so looking forward to having everybody here. What's next for, for this podcast? It's been great so far, and will continue to be great in the future. Last episode, we did the Atlantic Division season preview. This episode on Tuesday, October 17th, will be the Southwest Division season preview. Uh, we've got the Dallas Mavericks with Grant Afseth of Dallas Basketball. We've got the Houston Rockets with Jackson Gatlin of Locked On Rockets. We've got the Memphis Grizzlies with Joe Molinax of Locked On Grizzlies. We've got the New Orleans Pelicans with Shamit Dua of the In The Know podcast. And we've got the San Antonio Spurs with Paul Garcia of Spurs cast. Really excited for this group. Lots of fun conversations here. An interesting division to be sure. And if you are happy with the coverage, make sure to subscribe on the audio side of things. If it's Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get podcasts, that would be fantastic. But if you're on YouTube and you have enjoyed the individual releases of these episodes as opposed to the bulk release on, on the audio side, uh, then go subscribe to the YouTube channel as well, which is at the Alley Oop NBA. Uh, really appreciate all of the love and support on the show so far. It's just the beginning, folks, and thank you so much for a successful successful release. It's been uh, it's been fantastic. Without further ado, let's get into the episode. But first, the alley oop. Run two on one, green the finish. Wow, the alley oop. Turn the corner inside. All right, joining me now, Grant Afsef covering the, the Dallas Mavericks for Dallas basketball. Grant, thank you so much for stopping by. Really appreciate you and, and all the coverage that you're going to do for the Mavericks this year. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really look forward to uh, being a uh, you know repeated guest uh, talking about the Mavs and uh, you know joining all the you know the awesome people that cover other teams uh, that you have involved. Uh, you know with the other thirty or I guess just, I should say twenty nine other teams uh, for sure. It's going to be fun. There's, there's a lot of cool people that are associated with this project, but let's talk about the Mavs. Let's talk about what I think has been uh, 0-3 to start preseason, and, and we're, we're recording this on October 14th. That uh, Probably not the way that the Mavs were hoping the preseason would go, if I'm being honest, just just the way that things have kind of strung out. But what what's the most interesting thing about the team right now from your perspective? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for them right now is that both of their superstars are dealing with like day to day injuries. And there was a lot of talk about the importance of having a full training camp, uh, you know, with those guys to be able to build chemistry, not only with each other, but with the team as a whole. They made a lot of roster changes this offseason. Uh, they you know, ha- didn't have a great opportunity to build continuity after that midseason trade last year. So this was going to be their chance to, you know, install everything that they needed to install in the offense, build build some continuity, get the rotations down defensively. But, uh, you know, a 12-day international uh, preseason trip definitely makes it more challenging to have that yeah. sort of comfortable, like, regular environment where you're not having those full practices. You're, you know, you're doing a lot of different things than you normally would. It's more about team bonding with, like, team dinners and just, you know, long plane rides and, you know, sightseeing together as opposed to, you know, really, like, I, like – you know, buckling down and getting all the X's and O's and all the all the little details on court work that you would typically do. Like, say, if you're, you know, like the team that you're focused on, like the Denver Nuggets having a training camp, you know, in, in North America. Uh, so, yeah, it'll be interesting because, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of not a lot of clarity uh, right now uh, on those injuries either. So we, you know, like this upcoming week, as you said, we're recording on, uh, you know, Saturday, October 14th. Uh, you know, they resume practices on Monday, you know, October 16th, and it's still not sure, like, how much, you know, Kyrie Irving or Luka Doncic will be able to participate uh, in those, 
you know, practices and they have a final preseason game on October 20th, 20th before an October 25th opener against, uh, you know, Victor Wembanyama and the Spurs. Yeah. So it's like their time's kind of been sucked pretty uh, aggressively for, uh, you know, their preparation time. Like that was kind of package as like a big benefit of having, you know, like, like a training camp period. It's, yeah, so this is, this doesn't give me a lot of confidence, if I'm being honest, the where you have a team that finished poorly last year. Obviously, there were some relative shenanigans with, with maintaining the draft pick that they had. And uh, Kyrie and Luca, Kyrie played really well. Luca didn't play great down the stretch. And uh, you've just got a lot of new faces now. When I was doing the key additions and key losses for this team, I was like, okay, Grant Williams, Seth Curry, Olivier Maxence Prosper, Derek Lively, Derek Jones, Dante Exum. Like you've got six new guys, I think, that could really see rotation time unless I'm missing somebody else. But uh, I'm, I think I'm mostly curious right now who starts next to Luca and Kyrie. Is is it going to be Josh Green, Grant Williams, Dwight Powell? Is that the, the trio that we're looking at? Well, for the uh, start of training camp, the locked in starters were, you know, like Kyrie Luca as the backcourt and then Grant Williams. And then it was kind of about figuring out if Derek Lively can, can di- differentiate himself from the other center, you know, potential competition with Rashawn Holmes and Dwight Powell. It sounds like uh, he will be the starter as of wow. like today. Like it's hard to like say like a, a lock or anything of that nature, but. You know, like in the last like post game, you know, press conference, like to get kind of an update on what Jason Kidd's thinking. He did say when talking about the rookies, uh, you know, Olivier Maxon's Prosper and Derek Lively, that Lively's done everything we've asked, and he likely would be the starter on day one, but that uh, you know, Omax will likely come off the bench. So that leaves really just like, you know, as of right now, unless something really just changes in the next like, you know, I guess you could say eleven days or whatever. Um, like the last, you know, small forward spot, uh, or potential four spot. Cause today, uh, you know, Mark Stein reported that Derek Jones is a potential consideration for a starting role as well. And, you know, he did get first team reps, uh, in practice, the, the last practice before the team departed for, you know, like the middle East and Europe, uh, right. there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity to gain Intel or information, while the team was abroad, but at least, you know, that, that kind of shows that there was some experimentation in practice time, but uh, it's just interesting because with, you know, Omax prosper, you know, being a likely bench, you know, candidate at this point, uh, Josh green, uh, he's got not too much time left of being contract extension eligible before the season gets going. And, you know, there, there was a lot of talk about him, like, having confidence in his ability to be that like on ball defender to take tough assignments and, Hmm. you know, potentially start next to Luca and Kyrie, but it doesn't sound like he's necessarily differentiated himself to take on that role as like the clear cut option. So really right now, what we're probably looking at is either Josh green at the three with Grant Williams at the four, or they get kind of creative or interesting, if you will, with kind of an out of the box option with Derek Jones at the four with Grant Williams, most likely playing the three okay (laughs) that seems that is interesting that is a uh that is not the direction that i thought we'd be going here and to me that that screams concern that screams like like this could be a potential issue especially at the beginning of the season where as as poorly as the team finished up last year you'd want to get off to a good start you'd want to figure out how to bolster Luca and Kyrie in the best way possible. And I do think that the Grant Williams edition was good. I like Josh Green next to those guys. And and I, I think that the rookies in theory were a good idea, but starting a rookie immediately, especially a 19 year old center, that's scary. That's, that's a scary prospect for, for a team like this that has real concerns where y- you want to make sure to put your best foot forward for, for a team with two legitimate stars. And that seems that seems crazy to me, but okay. I mean, hey, we'll we'll see what happens with it. Is there enough defense in that group? I, I assume that that's the reason why Derek Lively is out there, and that the reason why uh, you might try to get a Josh Green or Derek Jones Jr. in that lineup as well. Is there enough defense with that group? Because it, last year that that was clearly the issue for the Mavs. Yeah, I think honestly the best way to put it is even before Derek Lively probably put on his his hat on draft day the team compared him to Tyson Chandler 
and they've done that since like summer league preparation. They've they've, they've said he's even taken leaps. I, I don't really know what practice facility leaps look like. Uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, yeah. they say he's done everything they've asked uh, on a daily basis. But he's worked with Tyson Chandler uh, at the facility. You know, he's he's done a lot of things like working on his touch, working on screening. You know defensive rotations his timing all that stuff uh getting vertical you know the long list of all the dirty work center stuff so sure. they ha- they're portraying a lot of confidence in that but i found it very interesting because i you know when i covered summer league uh as a crazy person i covered all all 11 days of Good the Lord. mavericks uh <laughs> summer league and uh throughout that whole time so jared dudley was the head coach for the summer league team and it was very interesting because this this whole situation is kind of flipped it was like omax prosper is ready to make an impact. It could take a month or two, but he he will be a very helpful player for us even as a rookie. And it'll probably take Lively some time to develop. But now it's like Lively might be a day one starter for us and Omax will come off the bench. And it's just kind of interesting where it's not like a lot of game action has happened. It's just been practice facility time. And then like, you know, kind of just strange settings for a, a team preparing for a regular season with two games in Abu Dhabi and a, game against a european team in madrid so it's just it's definitely going to be interesting to see early season and you know just historically speaking teams do not fare well like i was looking at a stat from matt moore of action network he calculated since like 2013 i think teams are like 13 3 and 1 or something along those lines uh of not meeting or, or basically being hitting the under for their regular season win total. So like there's a lot working against them overall from a jet lag standpoint, their superstars are dealing with day-to-day stuff already. And there's like rookies playing key roles, especially a, a defensive anchor, like figure out the NBA is one thing, but then having to play in a conference with Nikola Jokic, Anthony Davis, and like a lot of talent like that, it's just, it's going to be a very interesting uh, thing for us to continue to hop on these <laughs> these episodes yeah, like, throughout the season. I, track. I I am very excited to now hear the six week check in when this actually comes around because this is going to be very fascinating to track throughout the year. But hey, I mean we're we're gonna find out, man. Like this this should be it should be fascinating to see whether Omax and Lively can can do the things that this team drafted them to do because. I, I look at the rest of the roster if they're not able to contribute, and I see, okay, off the bench, you've got a guy like Tim Hardaway Jr. or Maxi Kleba. Jaden Hardy is somebody who could definitely provide some punch off the bench, but I, I'm not necessarily, especially if Maxi Kleba isn't the, the defensive player that he was a couple of years ago, then this is not the greatest group defensively. I think maybe Dante Exum gives some boost there. Maybe Derek Jones Jr., like you mentioned, gives some boost there, but. Uh, I just, I seems, seems a little bit low. So, uh, okay. Well then let's, let's focus in on a, on a record prediction. I know that that's kind of difficult to do right now with like, as, as many things are up in the air, but I had this team before the games against Minnesota, I had this team winning 45. I've bumped them down to 43 because I think that there's enough there that I'm concerned about. And now just continuing to hear this with you, there's enough there that I'm concerned about that this could be a slow start for the, uh, for the Dallas Mavericks. Yeah. I think honestly, if I had to predict as of today, I would say a winning record, but it would probably be in that 43 to 45 range, as you said, because I see a lot will be predicated on their health, uh, you know, week to week. day to day. Uh, it's kind of interesting that, you know, with Kyrie Irving, finishing the season last year with plantar fasciitis and then now having a groin injury uh, where he had to miss or at least out of precaution miss two preseason games out of three uh that, that's definitely not a good sign especially as we said like with the chemistry building requirement for a team that uh has like those six potential new rotation players overall uh yeah. that's very yeah that's it, it's gonna be very like on the fly very very interesting uh to say the least uh but yeah it's just it, there's not a lot of like you know calling cards where you could say this team has uh, you know outlier ability to do this outside of Luca's excellence as a you know creator and a scorer and then Kyrie providing like a, a punch when Luca's on the bench and you know just within the flow beyond that there's a lot of question marks I guess you could say swing factors if you will where you know like banking on rookies is never easy especially when you're 
you know, having one of them be a defensive anchor at 19 years old, uh, who on his draft report, uh, adding like lower body strength and getting pushed around by bigger players at college basketball, like uh, a calendar year later, might have to be a key factor guarding uh, Anthony Davis and Nikola Jokic uh, vying for playoff seating or in a playoff series, or if they get to that point. And then you also have, uh, you know, on the wing, it's just, it's kind of interesting because Josh Green, they poured in a lot of development into him. And this is, you know, like four seasons. Uh, they're not like clear cuts, like he's not like a clear cut starter where they're like, we're ultra confident in his abilities and we got our five. Like that's, it's definitely like an interesting thing with that. Uh, so, you know, this is a team that could definitely use like a six foot eight wing that, uh, you know, like a, I guess you could say like a mid-season trade uh, team to watch, like with a, a player like a Jeremy Grant would probably be a very helpful player, depending on you know finances. Sure. Not to start going down that yeah. rabbit hole, but like <laughs> they definitely are uh, in a situation where they probably need that type of a player to add into the mix uh, and kind of help. You know, I guess provide some help uh, on the wing defensively, and then also make it like a little more insulated for having a rookie uh, defensive anchor. Because you know, just looking at their other center. Spots, I, I don't think you can come off of a 2022 Western Conference Finals run thinking you needed upgrades at the five with those two options, Dwight Powell and Maxi Kleba still being on the roster and saying that's a solution today. And then also having Rashawn Holmes, who I think a lot of people, I don't know if you've like, like, seen his measurements, but he's more like six foot eight. Uh, like, he's a like shorter guy. That aren't like super aware of his measurements. Yeah, yeah he's a shorter guy. And if, and, you know, some of the players, the opposing players that I talked to during the season last year, uh, after they played the Mavs, like after the Kyrie Irving trade, they said they felt there was no defensive presence inside uh, for the Mavs. So having, you know, going from at least like a seven footer with JaVale McGee or like, you know, Christian Wood at six foot ten. I mean, he's a thin frame guy, but now going to like closer to six foot eight at the five would be a, a very interestingly like just odd odds like sort of this was our our change that we have to rely on uh to get better defensively like it's it's hard for me to put into words uh in a sense but uh it's gonna be uh a lot needs to go right with the rookies i should say if you're focusing on the mavericks and probably josh green needs to have a uh a take a leap again after a career year last year yeah those are probably the only ways that i could see this team making a deep playoff run i i think that you got to hit on some of the young talent and and they have to be able to push some of the veterans that have been around for a little bit, but also maybe getting a little bit stale with guys like Powell, Hardaway, Kleba, uh, even Seth Curry, although he's, he's a new option. He, he's been there before. Uh, it's it's going to be interesting. They, they need the athleticism. They need the size. They need the versatility that those guys provide. And if if they don't get it, then it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. But we will see. Uh, he is Grant Afsef of, of covering the Dallas Mavericks for Dallas basketball. Grant, thank you so much for stopping by. Really do appreciate it, and uh, can't wait to check back in with you later this year. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, and I really look forward to doing these uh, routine check ins. Uh, you know, I've never done anything like it, so uh, you know, being a part of something with a lot of other you know people who cover the league as well, hearing their perspectives is something I'm very uh, much looking forward to as well. Thanks, Graham. All right, joining me now is Jackson Gatlin, who covers the Rockets for Locked On Rockets. Thank you so much, Jackson, for hopping on, man. I'm really excited to hear and listen to your, your coverage of the Rockets this year. Excited to be here, man. This is such an amazing project that you put together, and I, I can't wait to kind of, you know, navigate this season and see how this team ultimately progresses and grows because I do think the Rockets are going to be one of the more fun storylines to follow this season just kind of based on where the organization has been and where they're trying to go this kind of being the transitional year if you will with you know bringing a new head coach the veteran additions all that that I'm sure we're going to dive into in in pretty extreme detail here in just a moment a, a nearly completely remade roster around some of the young guys. Uh, you've got some amazing additions in Fred Van Vliet and, and Dylan Brooks. Uh, my guy Jeff Green from the Nuggets is over there. Uh, Jock Landell as well. And then some high draft picks. Uh, but tell me, what do you think is the most intriguing storyline about the Rockets at this point? You know, I would say, I think it has to be revolved around Ime Odoka, right? And just kind of how he is 
implementing his image for this team, right? What the, the culture that he is trying to build, the structure that he's trying to implement, because you kind of already saw that with the Boston Celtics, right? He got one year, one crack at it, and things were not perfect right out of the gate for that Celtics team, right? They struggled, and they started to turn things around the back half of that season where they were just absolutely incredible, and then they went on, you know, this awesome finals run. Obviously, the whole situation happened with Ime. He was let go, ultimately had to, you know, spend the entire year away from the NBA and gets hired by the Rockets. And this is kind of a, it's not just like a redemption tour or a, a way for Ime to rehabilitate his image because he probably wants to be able to, you know, show, show, hey, Boston shouldn't have let me go. Obviously what happened happened, but you know, he's still, he probably wants to still prove he's a top five, top three, whatever you want to call him, head coach in the entire association. And then you also have the Rockets who they've basically been the NBA's tire fire for the last three years, right? They sought out to be the worst team in the NBA and acquired top draft picks. And uh, in the macro lens, they achieved exactly what they wanted to do, right? They were a very bad team. They acquired a lot of top end young talent. Uh, go back to the initial draft, the first of the rebuilding year uh, where they walked away with Jalen Green and Alper and Shingun. The following year, Jabari Smith Jr. and Tari Eason. And then most recently, this last NBA draft, Amin Thompson and somehow Cam Whitmore falling out of the top five, top 10, all the way to the Houston Rockets at pick 20. So a really star-studded kind of group of high upside, high potential individuals. They're kind of quote-unquote core six, if you will. But I think this season is going to be all about what can Ime Odoka achieve with this Rockets team because it's no longer, you still have to balance development with these young guys. You still have to figure out you know, how to get the best out of guys like Jalen, like Shingun, right? What roles do you deploy them in? All of that. But it's also about winning now. It's about this organization wanting to change the perception and get back to a place where they're playing some winning, meaningful basketball games. And that's why they went out and got the veteran additions of Fred Van Vliet, uh, Dylan Brooks, Jeff Green, as you already pointed out, who I will say was a rocket before he was a nugget. So this is his second stint. In that's Houston. true. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's just going to be like seeing how Ime kind of navigates this is going to be probably the number one storyline of this entire season. I'm looking forward to it. I, one of the major points that I had when I wanted to cover about this team is there's a distinct lack of professionalism and maturity throughout the last couple of years. And obviously, Kevin Porter Jr., for a variety of reasons, has, has kind of played himself and, and put himself out of the mix uh, but adding a guy like Fred Van Vliet does that replacement, adding a guy like Dylan Brooks to help on the wings and, and be a, a veteran defensive option there. Uh, there's reason to believe and there's reason to believe in Ime Adoka as, as a guy who can get the most out of a, a young team that has does have some veterans, but mostly a young team looking to take the next step. Is this team more professional and mature in your eyes? What have you seen from them over these last few days? Um, Ryan, it is a night and day difference from where this team is at now to where this team was at over these past couple of years. It's really unfortunate because Steven Silas is hands down one of the nicest, kindest, most genuine human beings you will ever meet. But at the same time, I do not think he was equipped to handle this situation in Houston, right? He was, I, I don't necessarily like the excuse of, okay, he was hired to coach a very different team. He was hired to coach. James Harden, Russell Westbrook. Sure, I get that. And Steven Silas is probably the exact type of coach that you would want to kind of massage the ego of a couple of star players and kind of, you know, more or less stay out of their way and just kind of empower them to do what they do really well. He wasn't the type of coach that you need to be this heavy handed, you know, disciplinarian for a group of 19, 20, 21 year olds who don't even know who they are as NBA players, let alone human beings yet, right? Steven Silas was kind of, he had this like, substitute teacher kind of youth pastor energy a little bit around the Rockets for the better part of these last two or three years. And it's really unfortunate because I do think there's a place for him in the NBA. I hope that he gets another crack at a head coach, you know, a coaching position somewhere else down the line. But Ime is clearly what this team lacked. They had no definitive leader. Sometimes that leader can be a player, right? Sometimes that leader can be a talented player who is just so amazing. Like they step into that role and they're clearly the de facto leader of a basketball team. They didn't have that, right? Because Jalen Green did not step in and, and, you know, he's still got this insane potential, but he's not very clearly the best player on a team yet. Albert right. and Shingun, all the talent in the world, but, you know, wasn't really empowered to be the best player on the team by the previous coaching staff. Now you probably make the argument that the best all-around player right now at this very moment is Fred Van Vliet, former all-star on the team. 
but is he the leader of the team? He's going to take a leadership role. The abs, the, the leader of this Houston Rockets team now is Ime Odoka. He is basically the face of the franchise. Now everything is Ime. Hmm. The structure is all Ime and a, a, a nice little wrinkle. And it might not seem like a big thing in the grand scheme of things, but you look at the Rockets did their open practice, right? Bring all the fans to Toyota center and have a good time. And, Last year's open practice, they basically rolled the ball out there and we saw like, you know, 10 minutes of scrimmage time. It was basically like the, you know, all-star game where guys are kind of jogging up and down the court, throwing lobs. And it's, it's fun for all of about two minutes watching, you know, you know, tall guys jump high and dunk, dunk hard, right? This year, we actually saw structure at open practice. Ime was running wow. legitimate NBA drills at open practice, giving us an actual peek behind the curtain as to what they actually do in practice. Some of the drills that they like to run where you put, Two minutes on the clock and you have to score 60, you know, make 60 buckets in two minutes. Um, hmm. Doing some shooting drills, kind of walking the fans through some of the paces that they actually go through every day in practice. And that's like just this small little like microcosm of what Ime brings to the table from a structure and accountability standpoint. And you see that in talking to the players and talking to him and talking to people around the organization. Everything is so different this time around. And it really does feel like now that you have some adults in the room with Ime, with Fred, with Dylan, with Jeff, with Jock Landale, uh, also Reggie Bullock added to this cast of veterans, that's going to go an incredibly long way in helping these young guys grow up a little bit faster because they really haven't been met with many expectations over the last two years. I love it. That's exactly what you want to hear if you're, if you're a fan of the team, if you are an analyst, somebody who is looking for for this team to kind of just take steps in the right direction. And it does feel like that they're they're trending in a great place. And you saw some some flashes, obviously, from guys over these last couple of years. Jalen Green, Alper and Shangun, notably uh, Jabari Smith had a fantastic summer league and deserves a lot of credit. And then you draft a couple of young guys in Amon Thompson and uh, Cam Whitmore, who should be a very talented, interesting prospect as well. Uh, which of these guys are going to be the cornerstones? It does, or does it matter? Does it matter at all at this stage? Or just waiting to see who kind of emerges naturally? Or is there is there kind of a pecking order to this thing? I think when you look at this year specifically, it's going to be a very big year to kind of find out, right? As year threes go for NBA players, that's kind of when you start to really find out who a player is as an NBA player. And they start to kind of cement their identity. Are they able to achieve some of their you know top-end potential so this is going to be a really big year for Jalen Green and Alper and Shingun, both entering their third year. The Rockets drafted them back in 2021, and they were kind of the, they took the biggest swings possible with those guys, right? Because Jalen Green's top end potential, right, is he's that, that mold of like the superstar two guard bucket getter, 30 plus points a night, ideally good efficiency, that kind of thing. Alper and Shingun, Turkish League MVP at 18, could run an offense through him. He's exactly the type of guy that you see in that, you know, Jokic, Sabonis mold of, he could roll out of bed and get you 20, 12, and 5 on any given night if you really lean into his offensive skill set. So I think they've got as many, they've got a lot of bites at the apple, if you will, right, with all six of these guys. Um, even Tari Eason, who's been almost kind of pigeon-held into this idea of like, oh, he's like the perfect 3 and D role player. Like Even he might have some upside potential to his game that hasn't really been tapped into quite just yet. He talked about the other day wanting to be the best defender in the NBA one day in his career, and he's got all the physical gifts and the kind of innate defensive basketball IQ to achieve that goal at one point, you know, at some point down the line. So maybe you see that, but for me, I think it's going to be a re really pivotal year for Jalen green and Alper and Shingun to kind of figure out who they are as NBA players, what their ceilings really are. And there's no longer any excuses for either of those guys, right? The last couple of years, you could make the excuses. There weren't expectations. The defense across the board was bad. So those guys could get away with being bad defensively. Offensively, there was a lot of selfish play at times. Your turn, my turn, all that. All of that is out the window now. Ime Odoka demands accountability. He demands respect. He wants all these guys to play an unselfish style of basketball. He wants them to have a defense-first mentality, saying and doing all the right things. And it's never really been about, like, buy-in, I guess, because there's never been a lack of effort from Jalen or Shingun as far as just the amount of work that they do put in. There's moments where, you know, they take plays off defensively or it's lazy to get back in transition. Sure. It's bound to happen with a team that's going to lose 50 to 60 plus games every year, right? Um, so they've got pretty big years ahead of them. No excuses for either of them. We're really going to find out who they are as players, but kind of my bold prediction going into this year is that by the end of the season, I think Jabari Smith Jr. will be the best overall player 
on the Houston Rockets when you take into account his offensive and defensive contributions. That is a big, bold prediction right there. Just kind of going from where he was in his rookie season to where you expect him to be. And there, there's a lot of talent on this group. There's a lot of quality players on this team now. And if Jabari Smith were to emerge, that would that would shift things significantly, I would say, about about just what you're what you're hoping for the vision of this team to be going forward. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, I did a a show of mine over at Locked on Rockets in the past where we kind of ranked the importance of the six core prospects for the Rockets. And I do think when you look top to bottom at this roster, for me, the two most important pieces of this Rockets rebuild, as far as those six prospects go, are definitely Jabari Smith Jr. and Amin Thompson. You can make arguments Mm. for one over the other, but I think when you look at those two guys, their two-way potential, what they bring to the table, their unique skill sets, their, their insane blend of physicals, of size, of athleticism, all of that, those are the two prospects that if you had the if you had to tell me Jackson which two if you could guarantee that they hit their ceiling which two are you going to you know pick and i'd probably pick Amin Thompson and Jabari Smith Jr. So at this point Jalen Green is kind of the de facto almost like face of the franchise because he was the first piece of the Rockets rebuild the number 2 overall pick the first guy drafted into the new era of Houston Rockets basketball but at the same time they haven't really anointed him like as the permanent face of the franchise, right? So at any point, Jabari could eclipse him or Amin Thompson could come out and hit the ground running in a big way this season where we look at him halfway through the year and we're like, oh, he's the Rockets' best player soon. Like he'll be the face of the franchise, you know, down the line or next off season, like they'll kind of shift the marketing campaign right now. It's very, it's very much a collaborative sense of all six of these young guys are on the same playing field. Clearly, some guys will get more shots, more reps than others, but none of them, I think, are being put on a pedestal above the others because, again, Ime wants to prioritize a team-first mentality, a team-first environment, and a very unselfish environment, which is a far cry from what they have been the past two years. I love what you're selling. This this all sounds fantastic, and I, I look forward to seeing how it plays out because I, I can see... 27 different combinations of things that happen with this group and hey one guy hits one guy doesn't two guys hit four guys don't and or you you could say four of these guys all look like they're going to be these future cornerstone type pieces and and we just don't know right now but watching this play out in real time is going to be really really fascinating Amin thompson I, i i love the vision that you have for him uh amazing athlete but also amazing like uh, basketball IQ and head on his shoulders. And so that should be very, very interesting to see. Um, all right. So with all that said, g- give me a win prediction for this year. Last year, team won 22 games. I I have them at 32 right now is the, the win prediction because it's just hard to see or hard to actually predict more than that within the, the West landscape as it is right now. But where, where do you see this team finishing? Yeah, well, first I will say uh, my vision for Amin Thompson is is only seconded uh, by his vision because his core vision is absolutely (laughs) insane. Like some of the passes that he throws are out of this world. Like he's got this really fancy, like over the top kind of like hook pass where he just, you know, rifles the ball across the court without even looking. He loves throwing no look passes, loves he's got this insane athleticism, right, where. You, you are often taught, do not jump without a plan of what you're going to do with the basketball, whether it's shoot, pass, whatever. He can. He can jump and not know what he's going to do with it yet because he's just gliding through the air and he's got all this time in the world to figure out what he's going to do with the ball, looking off defenders midair before he dishes up a, you know, a, a delicious dime to one of his teammates. So he's going to be one of the most electrifying players to watch in the NBA this year. As far as win totals go, the last I checked, I believe the... FanDuel win, uh, you know, over under win total was like 31.5, 31.5 for the Rockets. Okay. I think I'm smashing the over on that win total guaranteed. Now, Ooh. how much of the over? That's where I'm, I'm kind of aligned with you, where it's like the West is going to be a bloodbath. You've got 13 of the 15 teams in the West that ideally would like to be competitive and probably gunning for one of those playing spots or just a, a straight up playoff spot. Um, the two teams likely being the San Antonio Spurs and Portland Trailblazers that don't really care if they make the play in. Uh, I'm going to say somewhere safely in that 33 to 37 range is kind of, and I, I hate to give you a range, but that's going to be my range. So if we have to, if you want one solid number, I'll say 35 wins. That's completely fair. And I mean, it, it generally goes like, Hey, if you're, if you're covering the team, you'll probably have two more wins than what I have. Uh, that's, that's, that's been my experience while recording these previews. Uh, so it's a completely fair number. And I, and I think that there is a, a, 
a, a clearly a sense of optimism here that uh, it's nice to hear that after what has happened over the course of these last couple of seasons, that it would just be a breath of fresh air to, to kind of get back on track and, and play some some competent basketball again. So I'm really looking forward to it. What what does success look like for you and for for the Rockets this season? You know, it's tough because you don't want to immediately go from being so heavily prioritizing development to suddenly, oh, well, we have to win X number of games where the season is a, you know, is a disappointment. I still don't think you measure success for this season in in wins and losses, but I just think that there's, it's almost, and we were talking about this before we hit record, it's almost impossible for this team not to take significant steps forward this year because you've completely upgraded the coaching staff. You've added an immense amount of, you know, veteran talent to this squad. And then the final variable, and this is the one that is the most hard to pinpoint because it's the, it's the one that you really can't pinpoint is the internal growth of the young guys, right? How many, you know, how big of a step forward does Jalen Green take? How big of a step does Alper and Shingun take, right? Does Jabari become potentially the best overall player on the team? If, Two or three of the young guys take those significant steps forward here in years two and three for, for all of them. Or if a Min Thompson is just, you know, an electrifying impact rookie right out of the gate, then I think it's, you know, almost impossible for this team not to hit 35 wins and again, get back to a level where they're playing meaningful basketball games. Again, I do still think you have to look at the collective year because this has to be viewed as kind of a a transitional year for Ime Odoka, right? It, it, there's probably going to be some some growing pains along the way. It's not going to be perfect right out of the gate. If it is, then awesome. But uh, I, I think that this is going to be his year where he's kind of dipping his toes in the water, right? He saw the talent and the vision for this Houston Rockets team from afar. They brought him in. They've given him a lot of control over the organization right away, right? He didn't want to bring James Harden back because he didn't think the fit was correct for the culture, for the identity that he wanted to establish here in Houston. So instead of James Harden, which we knew that there were a lot of rumors about the Rockets and a potential James Harden reunion, instead, they hire Ime Odoka and he says, no, I have a very clearly defined vision for this group of guys. And in order to achieve that vision, I need Fred Van Vliet to make it work. So I'm drinking the Ime Kool-Aid. A lot of Rockets fans are. I really think everybody should, though, because... I think he's a top five coach in the NBA, and I think he's about to uh, do a complete 180 with this Houston Rockets organization. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun to track throughout the year. He is Jackson Gatlin covering the Houston Rockets for Locked on Rockets. Jackson, thank you so much for, for helping me out this year. This is going to be a very fun season. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. All right, joining me now is Joe Molinax, who covers the Grizzlies for Bluff City Media, as well as the host of the Locked On Grizzlies podcast. Joe, thank you so much for hopping on, man. I'm excited to, to get to know your work of, about the Memphis Grizzlies this year. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, I've been doing this a long time. This is a uh, year, goodness gracious, year 10, year 11, something wow. like that. It's all kind of running together. You know, I used to run Grizzly Bear Blues over at SB Nation when SB Nation was still SB Nation. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, you know, just a lot of work over a lot of years and following this team as long as I have. It, it's it's fun. It's a way to to stay up with the NBA. It's a way to stay in touch with the city that I used to live in that I'm very passionate about still. And obviously the Grizzlies, you know, I have one hobby. Uh, I'm very busy <laughs> in terms of my day job. I have one hobby that I have a lot of time for, and it's the Memphis Grizzlies. So I'm happy well, to be on with you. Well, we appreciate you uh, for, for doing all the work that you do for the Grizzlies. It's going to be a fun year for the Grizzlies this year, hopefully. And uh, it starts off, obviously, without John Morant. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that there are a lot of very interesting storylines for the Grizzlies this year. What do you think is the most interesting thing about the team as it stands right now? Outside of John Morant? Because mm -hmm. I think that has to remain the number one with a, pardon the pun, bullet. It is Morant's <laughs> ongoing evolution as a player and as a person. Uh, but I think beyond that is how the other two cornerstones of the Grizzlies, Desmond Bain and Jaron Jackson Jr., those are the guys with nine-figure contracts. Bain just signed a massive contract extension. Uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. will likely sign one here this coming summer. The Grizzlies have positioned themselves like the Golden State Warriors where they're going to have three dudes that they're going to pay a, a ton of money to, Morant, Bain, and, and Jackson Jr., and the rest of the pieces around them are going to be supplementary, probably interchangeable from year to year as those guys become veterans. As that proceeds, this is an important time to see what Bain and Jackson can be 
without Jaw on the floor. Marcus Smart's arrival obviously is important. He's going to add a level, a level, excuse me, of maturity and leadership that simply wasn't on the team last year. And as the Grizzlies turn into a championship contending team, you could argue they have been that since they've been the two seed in the Western Conference the last couple of years. But that hasn't translated to the amount of postseason success that I think Grizzlies fans and media that follow them kind of expect at this stage. Now it's time to take the leap forward. You've got three dudes under contract for half a billion dollars. It's probably time to start turning that page and being a a championship contender. These 25 games are going to be massive for them being able to hold that weight while Morant is out. And then when Jaw's back on December 19th, how quickly they can reintegrate him into the fold. The fact that he can be with the team throughout his entire suspension is gigantic. He can be at practices. He can travel with the team. He just has to be out of the arena by two hours before game time. That's the Mm. rule. So he's going to be with Memphis this entire stretch and how he develops and how on the court Bain and Jackson Jr. carry that weight and are able to redistribute it once Morant returns. That's going to be the biggest factor in determining just how good these Grizzlies can be. Yeah, I'm very curious to see how they tread water without him. Uh, they've got mm-hmm. a, got some interesting pieces, obviously. When you add a guy like Marcus Smart over the summer, he's going to be helpful. The sure. added growth of Desmond Bain and Jaron Jackson is going to be probably the most important thing, as you mentioned, uh, just in order to kind of stomach some of that loss. But uh, there are some other guys to mention. Derek Rose is a, another addition from this offseason. It seems like he could be pretty helpful in trying to tread water as well. What what have you seen from the rest of the Grizzlies in guys that you think could help them stay above water through the first 25? Derrick Rose might be the fifth man. You know, we were just talking about that on a a recent episode of Lockdown Grizzlies, myself and my co-host, Michael Cole, who's the uh, commercial appeals beat writer there in Memphis uh, for the Grizzlies. We talk about who that fifth guy is going to be, right? Because it's assumed that it's going to be Marcus Smart as that primary point guard. Then you have Desmond Bain, could it be Zaire Williams, a young wing going into a third year, pretty significant? You know, he's a legitimate six foot nine, six foot ten perimeter player. Theoretically, he would be the best fit, but maybe it's John Conchar, who has a very malleable game. You know, he he accentuates the positives of most of the guys around him. Perhaps it could be Luke Kennard, the sharpshooting three point marksman that next to Desmond Bain gave the Los Angeles Lakers fits in the playoffs. We went from in a world where Luke Kennard wasn't able to play for the Los Angeles Clippers. And then fast forward three months, and he was arguably the most important Memphis Grizzlies player going into a game six where he was injured. And Grizzlies fans are like, oh, man, Luke Kennard's out. We're going to lose. Well, the Clippers (laughs) are like, hooray, Luke Kennard's out. We're going to win, right? Like, it's crazy how things changed over that span of time. I I think that Derrick Rose is somebody that maybe, I, I know I'm guilty because of how New York went last year for him and thinking he was washed. Maybe he's not washed. And I think if you look at Marcus Smart and you see the success that he has had with the Celtics in the past as a secondary playmaker, as a combo guard, as a point to the lead, as a as a not the lead point guard, maybe it's Derrick Rose who's that starter. And then you have him and Smart and Bain kind of share that workload of the backup point guard. Maybe you don't have one in a traditional sense. That's going to be a major question to answer. Who fills that slot left behind by John Morant these first 25 games? Maybe it's Rose, and maybe that's a way that you maximize the best of smart. Rose looked pretty good in preseason game one. Granted, it was just one game, and it was just 14 minutes of play, but he played in the first half. He was able to get to his spots with ease. His floater was falling. He's a defensive liability, which is a concern. But at the same time, if he allows for Smart and Bain to be able to be their best versions of themselves, Maybe it's D. Rose that should be that guy for the 25 games that Morant is out. So it, that's the question. Is it Rose? Is it Kennard? Is it Williams? Is it Conchar? One of the reasons the Grizzlies should be picked to be at the top of the Western Conference, you know, at least in the top four or five teams, is the fact that they're so deep. Like They just have so many dudes that are good at playing basketball, and they've been together now for a while. So the camaraderie and the chemistry is already there. There's a reason to believe. There's absolutely a reason to believe. And, and given that this team over the course of these last couple of years has generally been pretty good at treading water mm-hmm. without John Morant, there's, there's a reason to believe that they could do it again, especially when you add guys like Smart and Rose and Kennard at the, at the deadline last year. So that should be interesting to track. 
Uh, beyond that, I don't have a ton of questions about the Grizzlies, especially during the regular season, as long as they, they stay healthy and as long as they stay sure. connected. Got a lot of talent. Uh, you get John Morant back, Marcus Smart, Desmond Bain. Those guys are going to be fantastic. Jaron Jackson, uh, Steven Adams, those guys are fantastic. I do have some questions about the wings and the forwards and especially kind of that six foot seven, six foot eight position that uh, I think has eluded the Grizzlies over the course of the the last couple of seasons. Uh, Grizzlies have, have been a, in general, a smaller team on the perimeter and, and have targeted guys like OG Ananobi and Mikhail Bridges in the past. But now you have uh, David Roddy, Jake LaRavia, John Conchar, guys of that nature who on this team, and uh, uh, Zaire Williams as well, who you mentioned, uh, who on this team are you looking to step up and, and kind of fill that void? Because that's that's probably the one weakness I can identify. Zaire Williams. He, he's the one, again, six foot nine, true perimeter player. You watch Zaire Williams play, you don't look at him and say, oh, that guy can be a stretch forward, right? He can be a combo forward. No, he's a legitimate wing uh, at six foot nine who would you know be more likely to play shooting guard than he would be to play power forward. I think that he has to be that guy. Now, you mentioned other names. Jake LaRavia ha- has a frame and a sweet shooting stroke that should translate translate well. David Roddy is extremely versatile. He's a guy who could play the three, play the four. In college, he played the five at Colorado State. So he can do a lot of things in terms of his frame. We mentioned John Conchar earlier. I'd rather it not be Conchar because I think he has a pretty distinct ceiling. He's already at his floor. Uh, he has a malleable game that fits well with other players, but what is the increase in value in terms of making the other dudes around him better as opposed to just his game being so fittable, malleable? Again, I don't want to keep using that word, but that, when sure. I see John Conchar, that's just what I think is malleability. It should be Zaire Williams because he has the highest ceiling in terms of physical ability, former 10th overall pick. And, you know, whether it would be Franz Wagner or, you know, Josh Giddy. There's rumors from that draft of who the Grizzlies really wanted to get, and then those guys were off the board, and Zaire Williams fell into their lap, and he was the next guy up. Trey Murphy the third has had a better NBA career so far, and that's the guy that the Pelicans took at 17 overall. Imagine if that dude was on this Grizzlies team. He'd be perfect. Yeah. Like He literally would be the perfect fit. And Zaire Williams has physical ability, has talent. He's really strong in the mid-range. But that's not really something that Memphis focuses on offensively. They focus on the threes and, and getting to the basket at a high clip, especially getting into the paint. That's where the Grizzlies really prioritize themselves. So they're not really a mid-range team, and Zaire is kind of a square peg trying to fit into that round hole in terms of what he can do now. So in terms of physical ability, it, it's Zaire Williams. But will that translate to what Memphis wants to do? That's an interesting question. They're revamping their offense. They were 25th, I think, in half-court offense last year. That's not sustainable for any team that wants to be a championship contender. So they bring in uh, Coach St. Andrews, I believe is his name, coming from Milwaukee. Obviously, the connection there with Coach Jenkins going back a few years uh, to their Bucks days. So I think that we'll see some offensive adjustments. And one of my hopes is whether it's just through player development or whether it's through no longer wanting to beat their heads against the wall, Zaire could be a DeMar DeRozan-esque, not in terms of quality. I'm not saying he's dropping 30 on people every night. I'm talking about that type of player who can get to his spot in the mid-range and hit that shot at a decent clip if he's allowed to. If they're going to keep trying to make him a three-point shooter, I don't know at this stage of his development if that's going to be a good fit for him or the Grizzlies moving forward. Going to be interesting to see that that'll be a situation to monitor for for the upcoming season for sure. Uh, As for the rest of this core, uh, John Mm -hmm. Morant, Jaron Jackson, Desmond Bain, those guys that you mentioned, hey, the the $500 million club where you you add those salaries together, that's a a, a large sum of money. Uh, Can this core win a title in your estimation? Can this core continue to develop and and be that group that that contends next to some of these other uh, giants in the NBA, whether it's a a Jokic-led Nuggets or a Devin Booker, Kevin Durant-led Suns or LeBron James, Anthony Davis, uh, Los Angeles Lakers. Like there's there's a lot of teams out there in the West and and the Grizzlies are are still soul searching for for lack of a better word. There's there's a lot to monitor on this group. Can they be the ones to get it done though? The Grizzlies are still the three core Grizzlies that you just mentioned. All three of them are 25 years old or younger, right? So I think we get and I'm very guilty of it too, we get into the habit of trying to rush that process. And that's something that's really difficult to rush. The Grizzlies are not 
located in Los Angeles. They're not able to recruit the greatest player potentially of all time in LeBron James because Hollywood is there and the weather's nice. Like they don't have that capacity. So they have to build their team from the inside out and they've got their three dudes. You know, they've got those guys, how they position pieces that are elite role players around them. That's the final stage for them to get to that Western Conference finals level. And once you're there, you're one of the final four teams in the NBA, you roll the ball out, you see what happens, right? I think that they are close to that. I think that Marcus Smart and Steven Adams very much could be uh, a starting two next to those three. That helps them get to that place because, again, we're talking about elite role players. Those are two guys that are very good at what they do. I think that Memphis will have a top five defense in the NBA, whether John Morant's out there or not, and that's what's going to keep them in games. And I do believe that they're going to have young players that are going to be able to accentuate what they want their stars to be. And that's what they're really trying to put the finishing touches around. How do you establish what Zaire Williams, what David Roddy, what John Conchar, you know, Conchar is not really young. I think he's 27 or 28 years old. Um, But these other more complimentary players, trying to find the right combination of them that are going to help them get over the top. And for this young team, to be honest with you, a lot of it is maturity. Like the John Morant thing is obvious. Uh, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson Jr., they are much more mature at this stage of their lives than John Morant. I'd say the evidence backs that up. But at the same time, they weren't able to step in and say, Ja, you have to stop. Ja, this isn't right. You know, for whatever reason, whether you want to say it's an organizational failure, the roster around him, You know, Ja has gotten to this place in large part because of Ja, right? He has to take responsibility for that. But you need someone like a Marcus Smart who shows you the way. I think that they kind of quadrupled down on youth last year, and that wasn't necessary. I think they're kind of correcting their course now, and they've got Derrick Rose. They've got Marcus Smart. They've got guys that can kind of help reinforce that young talent so that they can be the ones who help define what being a a professional is and your ability riddled top three can just kind of be themselves and and really prioritize being better as basketball players. And that is going to have huge value. I think that one of the biggest things the Grizzlies are missing us outside of half court offensive sets is that leadership component. And I I think it's arrived now, especially in the form of Marcus Smart. And you, you, you had that trade go down And Boston Celtics fans, who in terms of assets, pretty clearly won that trade. You know, they got a couple of first round picks plus the best player in the deal and Christoph Persingas when he's healthy. And all I saw on social media was them waxing nostalgic about Marcus Smart. That tells you about the value of somebody in a locker room, right? That may not show up in a box score. That might not be something that gets him to the all-star game or all NBA status. But the Grizzlies don't need that guy. Like Mikel Bridges or OG Ananobi would have been great, but they don't need that. They have their three dudes. They need someone who can help them kind of find the way through the adversity that they haven't been able to work through yet. And I think Smart was the best option available in that way. I remember when the Nuggets added Paul Millsap in the offseason of 2017. Yeah, good that that was a a great example of a team in need of a veteran leader to show them the way and to show them how to win. And it mm-hmm. may not have been the most important box score addition, but it helped the team grow and it helped the team learn how to do it. And and maybe that's maybe that's exactly what this team needs. And if that's the case, then he'd go down as a Grizzlies legend. That would be extremely cool. So I'm rooting for it for sure. Uh, As for a a season win prediction, I have this team winning less games than it did last year, which I think is only natural uh, given that John Morant's going to miss 25 games. I have them winning 48 uh, compared to the 51 that they won last year, despite the fact that this team generally does pretty well without their their leading guy. Uh, What what could we expect from a, a win prediction from you? I think around there is fair. I, I do believe I'm on the record as saying this. I think they'll struggle without Moran. I know they've been good in the past, but that's because Tyus Jones was there. And I think if you play fantasy basketball, you should take Tyus Jones late in your draft mm-hmm. and you'll look brilliant uh, because Tyus will be playing really well and be like, oh, where did Tyus Jones come from? Well, just watch the Memphis Grizzlies. And when he was a starting point guard for the Memphis Grizzlies, he was really good. 
he was not that good as a reserve. And I think that that is the thing that people miss out on. I call Tyus Jones the best substitute teacher in the NBA. He mm. was really good as a starter, and he struggled as a true backup to job this past season. Now he's the starter. I mentioned earlier in the show Marcus Smart being that true point guard. That makes me nervous. I know he did it the last couple of years, but it wasn't really until last year watching the Celtics play where they really put him in that space of, okay, you're initiating the offense more often than not. And obviously they had Brown and Tatum. They had the ball in their hands a ton, but it was Smart who was seen as that primary facilitator. And that's not his strength. That's not what he's best at. So that makes me nervous. Not necessarily a drop-off from Tyus to Marcus overall, but in terms of role. I think if Marcus is that secondary facilitator, he's better than Tyus Jones. If he's supposed to be Tyus Jones, Tyus is better at what Tyus did for Memphis. So I'm worried that they're going to start slow because they might try to force Tyus to, or excuse me, force Marcus to be something that he's not. But I do think once Morant returns, you know, the Morant, Smart, Bain, Jackson Jr., Adams, I don't know how you stop that consistently on either end of the floor. Uh, you add in Luke Kennard as a key reserve, Santi Aldama, who we haven't really had a chance to talk about. It had a great FIBA run with Spain. I think he's a three-level scorer that's going to create a lot of issues for mm. reserve bigs in the NBA. I'm excited for this team. I think 48 to 50 wins, even with those early season struggles. I think the Grizzlies are going to be the best team record-wise in the NBA from December 19th on when Morant returns. And I, I really do feel that this is a team – you know, if they're the third, fourth seed in the Western Conference, maybe they're a little bit lower than they've been the last couple of years. The moves that they've made and the things that they've done have very little to do with regular season success. They've had that. Now it's about April and May, and they want to get to those games in the best position to compete as they can. And I think that they are better prepared now, and they certainly will be, assuming health, in April, to be able to be the team that should be in the Western Conference Finals mix than they were last year because of the additions they've made and because of another year of growth and because of how, again, finding those elite role players. Adams and Smart are two elite role players next to your three stars. How does that progress beyond that? As, uh, as Denver Nuggets fans know, that's what makes you a champion. And, and that's the last kind of question that the Grizzlies are going to have to answer. But we will see if they can answer it this year. Joe, thank you so much for for helping me out this year. I'm really excited to read and, and listen to yeah. your Grizzlies coverage. Uh, everybody, you can find his work at Bluff City Media and on Locked on Grizzlies podcast. Make sure to follow him. And uh, Joe, good luck this year, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks. Same to you. And thanks for having me. This is a cool little venture. And uh, I've always respected your work. And uh, I appreciate you asking me. And we're going to have a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Joe. All right, joined now by Shamit Dua, who is doing great Pelicans coverage for the In the Know podcast, as well as writing for his own Substack, In the Know. Uh, Shamit, thank you so much for hopping on, man. Really excited to be able to talk Pelicans with, with you this year. Oh, I'm super excited. You know, when you when you hit me up, I was like, oh, sweet, we're about to we're about to talk some Pelicans and and do it with a mix of other other people and other teams. So this is uh, this is a good time. I'm glad you reached out to me. It's going to be great, man, and and I think. Pretty emblematic of where the Pelicans are at. This team could go so many different directions this year. I think if I had to put a pin in it, they are the team that I think has the widest range of outcomes just because of all of the health concerns, but all the talent that kind of goes with it. Uh, what is the most interesting thing about the Pelicans as as we enter this season? Well, the most interesting thing about the Pelicans remains Zion Williamson. I think he's kind of been the focal point of the team uh, from a narrative standpoint, uh, the last four years, his availability and lack thereof has driven a lot of conversation and, and a lot of conversation about what they should do and, and how good they can be. So I think last year they saw how good they could be. They saw a little bit of what the ceiling might look like when, when he's available. And they also saw kind of what the floor looks like when he's not available. And it's not, and it's not very pretty. So he's going to remain uh, the centerpiece of the conversation. And if he is healthy, they were going to be a very good team. No, absolutely. And got to see him in the preseason. Uh, I don't know if it was the opener or not, but definitely one, one of the first preseason games and and he looks pretty athletic, still looks really good, still looks like what, one of those dynamic athletes and basketball players that you need at the head of your team in order to win a win big in this league. Uh, 
is this the year? Is, is this the year that, that Zion and Ingram can be healthy at the same time and that things kind of come together for, for the Pelicans? It, it seems like things off to a good start outside of the Trey Murphy absence. Yeah, well, a lot is riding on those two being available, and uh, I would say people's jobs are riding on that. I, I, I think if this is another season where both of them are not available, um, there could be a lot of turnover happening within the Pelicans, both from a roster standpoint and a management standpoint. So there's there is quite a bit, um, quite a bit of stakes here involved with that. I do think for Brandon Ingram. You know, with these new all NBA rules that you have to play a 65 game minimum, he's up for extension. Uh, I think he's going to want to pursue that in earnest, right? When you make yourself super max eligible, that is a a significant amount of money. We just saw Jalen Brown lock down $304 million, something approximating that. And uh, if Brandon Ingram is able to push himself into the all NBA conversation and secure that spot. He's going to be looking at a contract similar to that. And so I think he's going to have a lot of external motivators to stay available with Zion. You know, that kind of contract isn't on the line right now, but you know, kind of his, his legacy as a player is because so far he's just not been available. And so, you know, are you going to flip the narrative this year on that? Um, You know, that, that remains to be seen. This team has, maybe the most dynamic group of wings and forwards in the league. That has been uh, pretty self-evident over the course of these last couple of years when you can name guys like Zion and Ingram, but also Trey Murphy, Herb Jones, and then guys like Larry Nance Jr., Najee Marshall even, coming off the bench. There's a lot of reasons to be excited about this team kind of from two through four The questions have always kind of surrounded what, what does the one and five positions look like CJ McCollum starting this year, Jonas Valanciunas starting this year. I don't think that's the long-term vision, but it's certainly the the present vision. Where where does the team kind of go with those two spots, if if you will? Yeah, I think I'll I'll try to answer the JV portion of it first because mm-hmm. he is, in my opinion, the most likely candidate to be moved, uh, both from a cap standpoint and just an asset management standpoint. Um, this is a team that wants to get out and run. This is a team that wants to be able to switch across multiple positions defensively. And uh, when you think of those concepts, you don't think of Jonas Valanciunas. Mm -hmm. And so um, he may be a player that's kind of the odd person out in this vision that the staff and the front office has for the roster as presently constructed. He also is an expiring this season and they are a team that are currently in the tax and um, he is their most movable salary piece to kind of, swing in either direction to come under the tax or swing for the fences and maybe upgrade at that position. Uh, with regards to CJ, he's under contract for a little bit longer than, than JV. And I think he's a little bit more difficult to move. I'm, you know, I, I do think he is uh, still a very good player and provides value to contenders. Uh, but that kind of narrows his market a little bit. It, you know, his age combined with the skill set combined with his contract, those three things um, don't, leave as wide of a market as you know you would think like you know if he was 23 24 it'd be a little bit of a different story but you know he's on the other side of 30 and uh he's gonna want to compete and so there's going to be a little bit of trying to get him where he wants to go if there's any conversation to moving him but for now the pelicans don't really have an a suitable replacement for him at the guard position that can be as productive as he is that can get up the volume of threes that he can can shoot the way he is so i don't see him going anywhere and they value his leadership a lot as kind of the adult in the locker room to where uh, those factors make it difficult to conceive a trade that the Pelicans would be satisfied with. Tell us about the Trey Murphy absence, just what the, what the general timetable looks like. And I know these things can get ambiguous, especially towards the end. Uh, But, but what does that look like and, and how does that impact the team? So he's, likely going to be out until late November, maybe, maybe a little bit further. They're very careful not to put a fixed time frame on it. This team has historically not received goodwill from the fans because uh, they put a timeline on someone returning and that timeline just is never met. So I think they're being careful not to put expectations. And, and from Trey's standpoint, he's also in a situation where he's not going to return until he's 110%. Um, but I think the general timeline is, is late November, early December, and, and, you know, to me, that's a, 
it's a bummer because he he had the potential to be the third best player on the Pelicans this season right out the gate. I thought he was in track for a, a track for a big year. He's already one of their most efficient players uh, mm-hmm. behind Zion, and it was going to be a season where I was looking forward to him absorbing as much usage as possible, to kind of figuring out, hey, what is what what can we turn this guy into? Um, but you know that's gonna that's gonna take some time, and I'm sure as he returns from injury, it's not gonna be a a seamless transition. You know, it'll probably take a few weeks, few months, uh, to get back to feeling like his normal self. And uh, the Pelicans, frankly, they they need his offense and they need his shooting. If you look up and down the roster, they just don't have someone capable of of replacing that skill set on on the ready. So um, the sooner you can get back, the better. Intriguing player and and somebody that I I held in high esteem after watching him a couple times this this last year and so seeing what he was a, capable of providing for a team that I think has the floor condensed as often as the Pelicans do with the both the styles that they play but also the personnel that they have I'm curious what the best version of this team looks like and we we did see some good stuff at the beginning of last year but there are also some questions as to what that like how sustainable that was and then whether it was just more of an early season kind of thing. What does the best version of the Pelicans look like to you? Maybe whether it's pecking order, whether it's style, whether it's personnel, what what are you thinking there? The best version of the Pelicans is completely dependent on Zion Williamson. And it's the team embracing and leaning and doubling down into this idea that he is their best player and everything else should be built with that in mind you know everyone else should be trying to fit around zion and not zion trying to fit in with everyone else and so you know that that involves baking in a ton of possessions where he is the on-ball initiator he is the primary creator that involves him being the primary decision maker down the stretch that involves furnishing him with adequate shooting uh so as you said the floor can't be condensed um as much as possible that involves you know finding multi-positional defenders which that part they have unlocked. You know, they they have found the multi-positional defenders um, that you can surround him with that lift those those units. Because the thing with Zion, you know, people talk about his defense, and and sure he has room for improvement on defense, but his units are almost always good on defense. Why? Because they score. They score the basketball, and they're able to get back and set. And they're primarily playing in half court. They're not getting out in transition. Um, and when they play in the half court and they play their switch oriented defense, they're solid. They are, and, and they're beyond solid. They're, they're borderline elite from a defensive rating standpoint. You know, how much of that is real? I, you won't really know until you face real competition until the playoffs and, and, you know, when the teams are game planning for that situation. So it's tough to say, but like if their purpose needs to be to keep the scoring up and um, just be fine on defense. And I think that that's po- entirely possible. So. That's that's where the focus has to be, and that's where the best version of this team is going to lie. Um, hopefully, that involves a future with Brandon Ingram. Um, but I am of the opinion if Zion is able to stay healthy and you get to the point where you feel uncomfortable about that pairing, you should not hesitate to move on for a better fit. Um, ultimately, I don't see them like breaking down that duo because of availability issues. Uh, I don't think there's a uh, right now Zion hasn't given them a great deal of confidence to fully lean in uh, in a way that, that moves away from Brandon Ingram because you just don't know if he's how long he's going to be on the court. And that really is the kicker right there because as, as oft like I, I love the vision that you're selling. I love the vision of, Hey, we're going to, bet on the best player. We're going to bet on the skill set of this guy. We're going to bolster him with the assets and then the personnel and the style that you need. But then if he's not out there and if he's, if he's not available, then that's obviously going to be a big damper and it, it could, it could deal with a couple of lost seasons and, and with as much money as he's being paid as much money as they're, they might be shelling out to Ingram and guys like that. I, I would be very hesitant and, and very nervous about that vision if I if I was Pelican's ownership. So it's frustrating. And I, I'm sure the fans are feeling that frustration, too. So with that in mind, I have this team only winning 39 games, which feels shockingly low, given the talent that that I mean, that they have and that they put together a 42 and 40 record last year with all of the the injury issues that they had. 
I, but with the West the way that it is, and like you just don't know who to pick and choose between which of these West teams is actually going to pop. And I, I think the Pelicans are probably more likely than any of them to kind of bottom out a little bit due to the injury side of things and and maybe to, to some fit questions. So where are, you, where are you at with this team? If you had to put a pin in it, like what, what would be the win prediction for for the Pelicans this year? Look, I'm not overly confident they're going to be some 50 win type of team or anything, but I do think there's a little bit of overthinking going on with them. I think similar to what happened with, with Jokic's Nuggets with the, the year where, you know, Jamal was out, you know, MPJ was out for an extended period of time. You're playing Compazzo, you're playing, you know, all of these players and, and Jokic is dragging them to 48 wins, right? Pretty much everything that went wrong, that could have gone wrong, went wrong last year, and they still hobbled their way to 42 wins. And and Zion played 29 of those games, right? Brandon Ingram missed, I think, 30-plus right. games. Uh, you, you had a litany of injuries to, to their main players, and they still won 42. So assuming, right, which is a big, big, fat assumption, assuming they e- <laughs> get even slightly better injury luck, it's it's hard to not see them at least replicating 42 you know, I think the the over under of forty four and a half, which is what uh, has been set, is a uh, a bet that I would not touch. Um, but you know, I think that's kind of like the reasonable range to to see where they're gonna end up. But like, if they're healthy, like they're gonna blow past them. Like that that that's that's not uh, something that's up to debate for me. Uh, if they're healthy, they're gonna blow past that. If they replicate last year's health. They should be even better, you know. They, I mean, I think I don't know how, like how much better, maybe one win better, but forty two kind of seems like the floor. So I think thirty nine is is something I would say is overly pessimistic. I think that's completely fair, and uh, I maybe maybe I am betting on the betting against the wrong Southwest team with the way that Dallas has looked so far, and the, and teams like that. So there are there are reasons to have faith, and I don't want to have that missed here. Uh, I just think that when you get started the way that they did with, with Trey Murphy already missing time, uh, he was one of the most dependable guys last year and you're already starting without him. And then maybe that's, that, that could be very frustrating at the, at the outset if you don't have his spacing. So uh, I'd be, I'd be a little bit cautious, but I caveat all of that. It's saying Zion, when he is healthy, clearly a top 15 guy in the league. Brandon Ingram has had top 25 seasons before. CJ McCollum is still a very, very strong guard and and has the capability to do a bunch of different things. And then like Herb Jones and Jonas Valanciunas and guys like that, that, there's still a lot of rotation talent here and a lot of starter talent here. So I I don't want to get it twisted. Like this team is very good. I'm just, if I have to bet on a team's health, I'm I'm probably not betting on the Pels. No, that's fair. That's entirely fair. So we will see what happens, Schmidt. What what would be the most su- like the most successful version for this team? What what would you call that? What what would be what would be a good benchmark for this team for you? They have to make it out of the plane. Uh, so top six, you know, I think is is what they should be aiming for, and and what I would define as a success for them. They've been a playing team the last two years. It's time to kind of graduate uh from from that and uh you know if they if they're healthy i genuinely think they're going to be a home court team but that just like you said we've talked about this over and over we can't you can't bet on that but top six is 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 sort of the the benchmark for did you improve or not well here's to it i I would love to see the pelicans in the playoffs again the last time they were there they gave the suns hell so I, i would love to see it for sure i'd love to see zion be able to to showcase his talents on the biggest stage as well so we will see what happens. He is Shemit Dua at Fear the Brown, covering the Pelicans for the In the Know pod, as well as writing for the In the Know Substack. Thank you, Shemit, for your time. I'm looking forward to talking to you again about the Pels this year. Thank you. All right, joining me now, Paul Garcia of, of Project Spurs and the host of the Spurs cast. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for joining me today and, and for joining me to cover the Spurs this year. Really excited, man. I'm excited too, man. It's, it's good. To, uh, you know, I usually host on my, on my own podcast, the Spurs cast. So it's actually nice to be a guest on someone else's podcast because, you know, not having to prep the questions and stuff. I like, I'd rather just answer the questions. It's a lot more fun that way. So it's, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I have found it's a lot more fun for, especially when, when I'm dealing with 30 correspondents to be able to chat mm-hmm. with everybody about their own teams and in their own expertise. So hopefully that, uh, hopefully that is an enjoyable experience for everybody. 
Uh, you know, it's going to be an enjoyable experience for everybody is watching Victor Wembanyama this year. Uh, I am very excited. We got to see uh, a nice debut from him in the preseason op- or in his preseason opener uh, going up against Chet Holmgren. And I'm, I'm just floored by how incredible he looks already. Uh, is he the most interesting thing going on with the team right now? I, I got to imagine so, right? Yes, he is. I mean, just by far. I mean, I, f- I kind of felt bad because all through training camp and media day was all about Wemby questions. And like at, at some point, we're going to cover the rest of the players. And then I found myself as I'm doing a podcast and also writing an article after that first preseason game. I just found myself just overwhelmed with Wemby content. I just really wanted to analyze all of his plays on offense and all of his his uh, his sets on defense. And so at this point right now, yes, he's just the most interesting player for that team right now. And, and I do I feel I feel kind of bad in a way because I'm not I know I'm not giving the attention at all to the other players, even though it's pretty much the same group from last year. There's just a, a handful of new players. But yeah, man, it's just like a totally new experience. Uh, like the players have said uh, in in past interviews. He, he wows you with one play every game, and, and you're going to see that. We already saw that in that first preseason game against OKC when he goes with that, that spin move to the right, then he kind of spins over and does the up and under with the left. So just incredible play from him already, and it's just something so new for the NBA community. I mean, it's got to be a zoo down there, if we're, if we're being honest. Like, this is this is something we've never really seen before, and Wemby, as, as a prospect, is somebody we've never seen before. Uh, just the entire experience with him, I, I know this is, once you, once you luck into that, everything kind of changes, everything kind of shifts. And and that's what the experience is going to be like for this upcoming season is how to surround him with the right kind of supporting cast and bolstering uh, him and, and making sure he gets the help that he needs. But it, it sounds like he's going to start at the four. Sounds like he'll play a little bit of five, just depending on the lineups, but maybe not full time. Uh, what what do you think of the experience this year? And, and is, is it going to be hitting the ground running immediately or is it going to be a, a bumpy along the way? Uh, I mean, based on what he did in that first preseason game, it looks like it's going to be you know kind of hitting the ground immediately. Um, it's, it is very interesting about where the Spurs are preferring to have him out on the floor. Like you said, he's playing more of the four. We saw him in that first game against OKC. And this also goes back to Summer League is he's guarding more wing players, players he guarded like Lou Dort here in this game. He guarded uh, Jalen Williams uh, out of Santa Clara. And so he's not getting matched up with those traditional fives. Uh, you know, he there was a few possessions there where he got matched up with OKC's five, which was Trent, uh, Chet Holmgren. But the Spurs weren't I- ideally seeking that matchup out. And Coach Pop even talked about it's going to take some time that right now the Spurs kind of, kind of want to be hands off right now. They really want to see the coaching staff where he's most comfortable on the five. Is he better inside, outside? They want to get maybe some data, some percentages. Also, Pop talked about how it's more so about matchup dependent. If there's a very physical center down there in the middle, then they don't want Wemby near the paint. But if it's a player where maybe Victor has an advantage with his, his length and his size, then maybe they do want to patrol in the paint. And so I think it's very interesting. I think they're going to experiment a lot with him in different positions this year. And so I think we could see him at different points of the game, like you said, very matchup dependent, uh, him playing inside, outside. And, and there, there are going to be some bumps and bruises. You know, it's not always going to be perfect. Like, I know he had a really good shooting night here. We did see, though, in, like in Summer League, uh, he will have some of those games where he does struggle making his, his outside shots. So it's going to be, um, you know, a work in progress. But I think just from what you see, just the, the spacing on the floor, just the opportunity of him to be playing now alongside better players and, and the Spurs group and against better players and the, and the, and the other teams, I think we're going to get to see him flourish a little bit here early on in the start. It should be fun. And so I, I cover the Nuggets here locally, and, and I can – automatically see the the version of the Spurs that has Victor Wembanyama roaming off of Aaron Gordon, trying to help onto Nikola Jokic as a, as a help side rim protector. And then Zach Collins being the one to kind of take the brunt of that. Uh, but how, however they handle it, like that's just, it's going to be so fascinating. And he's just such a unique experience. And then the way that he's going to impact the game on both ends of the floor, I, it's going to be fascinating, but we, we should talk about other guys. Let's talk about uh, Devin Vassell just got a new contract. Keldon Johnson mm-hmm. is entrenched in that starting three, I think. And then Jeremy Sohan is, uh, I, I have him currently penciled in as a sixth man because I mean, how, how could you not after what he did last year? What are the next steps for those guys, especially kind of reorienting their game around a guy like Wembenyama? Yeah, so Devin, we saw, you know, he had a really good season last year aside from the injuries. That was really what plagued him here. And, and of course, the Spurs weren't forcing him to come back to games because, you know, they wanted to be a bad team last year to end up with that chance of getting Wemby. Uh, but Devin, you really saw progression from him last year in terms of running pick and roll, um, being being a being a lead ball handler in, in certain kind of scenarios. So I think that's what you want to really see him continue to develop is more so in the half court. How's he executing his offense? We know he can be a lights out shooter. He, he showed that uh, he struggled a little bit in that OKC game, but he, they did have a scrimmage on Saturday and he and he and he showed that his outside shot and that's something that that they're kind of banking on so I think more so for him it's more so like on the defensive end you know can he start being a lockdown defender or is he more so like a help defender and then offensively is more so you know what can he do to create in the half court 
Keldon's going to be interesting because now, um, you know, he was the leading scorer last year almost because he was put into that that role because Devin was hurt. They didn't really have a go-to player anymore with DeJounte Murray traded the year that summer before. And so now Keldon almost has to take a little bit of a reduced step back because Wemby's going to, we saw in that first game, Wemby had the highest usage rate. And we think that they're going to run a lot of sets through Wemby uh, here on offense. He's going to be their focal point. So, so Keldon has to kind of figure out how is he going to be as, as more of so like a secondary playmaker. And um, we also saw that his shot, he kind of struggled last year with that, that three point shooting where he was kind of on fire from, from the start of the season to December. Then it kind of just tailed off and uh, it never got quite to that consistent rate. So that's something to watch if he does start is can he, can he continue to shoot those outside shots very well? And then Sohan, like you said, I think that he'll end up starting off on the bench just because they already have, you know, a full starting group out there. And for him, it's more so um, just continue to, to create. I think they're going to want a lot of possessions with him and Wemby out there. And that's where you might see Wemby more so at the five is what Sohan's there at the four. And just defensively, they're going to be they're going to be a force defensively, being able to switch to different positions, being able to create havoc and, and help each other uh, against those different matchups. But then on offense for him, he's going to like playmaking wise he's going to be okay i think it's more so his shot also like he doesn't really he didn't come in as a shooter we saw him go to that one-handed free throw form last year which that improved his free throw accuracy he says he's going to continue that this season but again it's more so like in the half court what's he going to be able to do on the offensive end are people just gonna our opponents just gonna sta- stagger off of him or they're gonna actually like you know commit to, to guarding him out there i can imagine this team matching up with teams like the the, uh, the celtics and the warriors and teams like that and just being an absolute nightmare with with Sohan just switching everything, Wemby even switching everything on uh, one through five, and and just being a pterodactyl out there who can who can really block up as many of those those possessions that most of those teams can get as possible when other teams go small. Uh, should be very fascinating to track throughout the year just how their defense reacts and and what the, what even their offense is going to look like in, in that kind of system. Uh, other guards, uh, Trey Jones has been the guy as the the starting point guard for a little bit here. But other guys like Malachi Branham, like Wesley, those guys, I, I think Spurs fans have have some confidence in, in those guys developing a little bit and want to see what they look like uh, with additional reps. Where can you tell us about those guys? And, and is this team just looking for at least one of those guys to kind of step up as that lead guard of the future? Yeah, so Trey Jones is more so like they, they re-signed him in the summer. He got a he got a new deal. He's more so just your typical quarterback. You know, he's going to set up the offense. He's not going to be too aggressive offensively in terms of trying to find his own shot. And that's kind of what they need because they have playmakers out there like Keldon, Vassell, Wemby, and that starting group. So we do see that Trey's probably going to start there at the point. Um, that's kind of what he's going to do for you. And then defensively, he's a good guard who kind of you know really tries his best out there and doesn't lose lose his focus. Um, Branham's made a leaps and bounds. We saw him make some incredible leaps in the minutes that he got last year, starting in February when he started to, to get consistent minutes with all the injuries to the to the other players and then even in this first preseason game and his first scrimmage he just looks like he's continued to flourish i know that he went over the summer to um i don't know what i think it was spain they had like a little um the nba players association had a little camp out there and brandon was one of the players who was invited to participate so he got to play with other nba players and we see that he's continued to show progression and especially in the nice. half court i mean he's just really he's just really fluid in the half court of running that 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 um you know his mid-range jumper things like that he's he very much has a comp to like chris middleton of the bucks and that's kind of what you see in his game a lot uh, and he's very polished um, for, for a second year player Branham the question mark player is Blake Wesley where he um you know he didn't really show a lot of um, strengths last year I know that he was dealing with injuries throughout the season then in summer league he quite didn't have a uh, you know as good of a summer league as you would have thought even even the, the assistant coach who coached the team um Matt Nielsen he kind of said you know he had an up and down summer league and you, you usually don't hear a coach say that you know out loud about a player yeah. and so he actually had those comments in summer league Blake was very kind of up and down in summer league in this first preseason game against OKC, he did he did he did have a pretty good game here. But again, I think that it's more so that consistency. And so I feel like Wesley's a player that if he's not if it's not happening for him early on, Pop will give him his chances. But after that, I mean, Pop will go to the bench and he'll go to like Devonte Graham, uh, to, you know, the, the veteran player who's ready to, to step up and, and shoot if they need him. Or if not, they may even look at a play a younger player like Serge Barry Rice who they just added on a two way contract. So again, Wesley's more so that player who has some question marks and he, he's really got to show some promise this year now in his second year. So there's a few veterans that are that are going to be mixed in with these young guys, but it really is still a developmental team. Uh, like Zach Collins will help, Devontae Graham will help, Doug McDermott, uh, Shetty Osman, Ken Birch, those guys will help, and they'll probably all play various roles throughout the year. But uh, I, I still see this team as a young developing team, and, and with that is going to naturally come some losses. But uh, it's it's not necessarily about the the wins and losses with this team. It's more about, hey, how can you get these guys up to speed over the course of the next couple of years. I think Spurs fans understand that and appreciate that, especially when you've got a guy like Wembenyama, who, you know, his prime is going to be seven years from now. So you can you can take mm-hmm. your time with with something like this. So 
for their season, I, I've predicted the same number of wins, 22 wins. And that might seem okay. pretty low to, to Spurs fans, especially when you get a guy like Wemby. And it probably is. It probably is. But I, I don't think he's going to play the entire season. I, I think he's probably going to be uh, may, maybe 60 games. That that seems like a, a fair, fair estimate in the, the first season. But it, it will be some growing pains with him, but it'll also be some fun flourishes and stuff that Spurs fans can be really excited for going forward. What, where do you see them finishing season win prediction wise? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, I know that Vegas had him like a 28, 29 and a half uh, over under. And then uh, Kevin Pelton of ESPN recently put out his model where he had him at 26 wins. I kind of see them somewhere in that middle, like 27, 28 wins. Again, I don't, I don't know quite that they're going to make that those leaps and bounds. And that was something that, kind of threw people off was Pop's comments um, at media day where he said, you know, we still want to continue to learn and develop as a young team, but also we want to win this year. So I think that when you're saying wins, it's not going to be like, you know, expecting playoffs or play in. We're talking about just a few more wins than maybe those 22 than last year. So I, I do expect them to do a little bit better. Maybe like I said, 26 to 28 wins somewhere around there. But um, like, like we saw with their moves in the off season, they didn't make a lot of moves to, to aggressively try to put a winning club around, around this team in, in year one of Wemby. What we saw was them kind of trade for players on veteran contracts um, who are not even on the team anymore, like campaign Reggie Bullock, more so to get those, those future second round picks, those kind of deals. And they could have, you know, maybe gotten involved in the Dame sweepstakes or, you know, some of those other players that were out there, but they showed they were going to be very patient. So, so yeah, the, the expectations aren't very high in terms of, of, of wins for this team. And, and also something that, that just mentions uh, how you mentioned about Wemby, maybe not playing the full season is we saw how the NBA has kind of scheduled their calendar where they put a lot of their primetime games early on in those first two to three months. And then after that, it kind of gets kind of quiet for San Antonio. So yeah, I'd say somewhere like that 27, um, 28 kind of win range. I think that's completely fair. And that, that's just kind of what happens. I've, I've, I've done this now a few times here and, and seeing the, I, I'm always a couple wins lower than, than uh, my, my counterparts across from me, but that's perfectly fine. And I totally understand it. So uh, last thing for you, what does success look like for this team? Because as we mentioned, it's, it's going to be multiple years down the road. If it's going to be 27 to 28 wins, what are Spurs fans looking for first and foremost? I think you I think you need to look at just some minor improvements on, in different areas of the way they finished last year. So for sure, like they've talked about the players and coaches uh, defensively, they were 30th dead last in the league. You know, can they get in that like 20 to 25th range, kind of somewhere in there, just showing some sort of improvement there. Offensively, same thing. Can they make a little bit of, of a leaps and bounds? And then just um, like I said, if, if they, as long as they can beat those 22 wins, I think they can just they can just have a few more wins better than last year. That's showing some growth from this team. Maybe in the individual players, you, you do see some of those players co- continue to flourish. Maybe they don't make all star teams or anything like that, but they continue to show some development. So I think that's more more so some realistic expectations rather than looking at oh playing game right away in year one. I, I don't think that's quite the um, the goal right now for this team. I think that Wemby's going to make a serious push for the All Star game. I don't know what you're talking about over there. I think he's I, that <laughs> no, no, he's is, got it. He's got a chance. Yeah, but I was talking like the younger <laughs> players, like Vassell and all yeah, those yeah, kind of guys. Yeah, no, I, I totally fair. Wemby is going to be so fascinating to watch, man. I can't wait to to catch it all with you, Paul. Thank you so much for hopping on with me. He's Paul Garcia covering the Spurs for the Spurs or Project Spurs and the host of the Spurs Cast. Uh, thank you so much, and I am looking forward to chatting more this year. Awesome, man. We'll do another check in soon. All right, that is going to do it for the Southwest Division preview episode of the Alley Oop with Ryan Blackburn. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you to the correspondents for stopping by and sharing their time gracefully. Uh, really enjoyed all of these conversations, and I'm excited to check in with these guys in the future, too. Uh, should be a lot of fun. The next time I talk to the Southwest will probably be about mid-November or so, uh, but maybe we will talk about the, the Southwest even sooner than that. Who knows? Thank you so much for tuning in. The next episode will be on Wednesday, October 18th, covering the Central Division. Damon Giannis, that should be a fun one. Should be very, very fascinating. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow.